Welcome to the Principles of Performance podcast, where we discuss how to optimize your health, fitness, and performance. Drawing on decades of experience of working as coaches, consultants, and trainers to top performers, athletes, and teams from professional sports to top universities to the U.S. military, Eric Degatti and Mike Perry discuss topics and strategies of how to perform at your highest level and be your very best. Join us and our friends and colleagues who are leaders in the fitness and performance industry as we investigate and challenge the most popular training, nutrition, lifestyle, and recovery protocols. Hey everyone, real quick before we get the show started, I want to share with you something that we're really excited about. Mike and I launched Principles of Program Design just about two years ago, and since then we've been working really hard on building more and more content, and we're finally ready to release some of that great new stuff. We're having a updated version of our original online foundations course where we've added three new bonus chapters. We've also updated our live course, and we're going to be doing that in April at Skill of Strength in Massachusetts. We also have three brand new online courses, including our exercise coach course, where we teach you our belt system of how we progress and regress and coach exercises, as well as group mastery, where Mike shares his systems for how he implements his successful group fitness training programs up at Skill of Strength, as well as something called Primed, where we teach you about programming warmups And then in addition to that, we're also launching a virtual mentorship where we're going to work hands-on with a select handful of coaches and trainers working with you every week on how to develop the best systems and programs to build a successful career. And then in addition to that, we're putting together a free ebook as well as a supporting webinar where we're going to give you our top 10 tips to a successful career in the fitness industry. We're going to share with you our secrets and our systems that we use that have helped us open up our facilities as well as speak around the world and work with some of the best athletes uh, out there. And so to get more information on all of this, go to principleswebinar.com and you can find out about all the new and exciting stuff. Now, let's get ready to get started with the show. And away we go. Here we are with the Principles of Performance podcast. We are at episode 60. I am your host, Eric Degatti, along with my friend and co-host, Mike Perry. Mike, welcome to another amazing episode. And I know you're going to give me hype for this one because it's a topic that we're both very passionate about. Yeah, we have got an exciting guest today. And yeah, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, which is long term athletic development. But I don't want to steal anybody's thunder. So Eric, I'm going to have you go ahead and and finish up uh, with our introduction to our amazing guest, and then we're going to get rolling. Yeah. So when it comes to LTAD, or you know, as it's shortened, the long-term athletic development, there's there's probably nobody better that I want to talk to about this than than Milo Bryant. And uh, Milo and I met going way way back at an FMS uh, instructor meeting a million years ago. And um, and I want to talk with you about the push-up thing when we get when we get going, Milo, because that still sticks out in my mind. But um, Milo's the he's he owns uh, Milo Limitless uh, Limitless Fitness, a completely outdoor performance training gym in Del Mar, California. California. He was complaining this morning when we logged on about it. it was a little bit cloudy in San Diego and he got no sympathy from the Boston and Jersey guy. Um, he's the founder of the Coalition for Launching Active Youth, uh, shortened as Clay, an organization that he established to help fight against sugar, boredom, video games, televisions, and adults who have lost their inner child. And fundamental movement is Milo's weapon of choice. Uh, he gets children and those of us who are not so childlike uh, moving nationally and internationally while educating them on uh, youth health and fitness. And he's a life coach and an advisory board member for Titleist uh, Performance Institute and also an award-winning journalist who's co-authored the book Movement uh, from Functional Movement Systems uh, with uh, a common friend, Gray Cook. And it's awesome to have him on the show. Thank you for coming on, Milo. Hey, thank you for having me, guys. I, I really appreciate it. You know, like I was telling you earlier, I saw the list of people who've already been on this show and it's like, I just graduated. I just made it to the big boys league. Well, sometimes it's better. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, Milo. But, uh, but with that, so um, you work with athletes across the, the the full continuum in terms of age groups. So, you know, 
at what age do we start considering a child an athlete or are they just a kid or are they both or when does it overlap? Oh, wow. That's, that's, that's a very interesting question um, uh, for me to answer because I look at, at uh, you're an athlete from the time you're born. Um, and so, cause, because there are things that we're able, that we're able to do with, with children um, when they come home from the hospital, literally. I mean, I, I had, I had my, my oldest daughter, the day she came home from the hospital, I am literally sitting there and I have this new living, breathing, eating, pooping, crying, you know, play toy with me, new, new buddy. And I'm sitting there now she's lying, lying on the, on the bed and I'm, I'm, uh, uh jingling some keys. And so I'm looking at her eyes, her eyes are just like fixated on, on the keys. And then I started moving them over and her eyes started tracking over and, and started tracking back and her head was turning and all this stuff. And so I reached out and I grabbed her chin and I still see her eyes moving back and forth. And what I had no clue about was I'm literally working on eye hand coordination stuff then, but I'm just playing around. And so, but there's plenty of research, there's ample research that goes to show that that something such as that you know, is, is, is going to help the, the young person later down the line. You know, so I'm getting them started early. I mean, there's, uh, you, you can go back to uh, Muffet, not Muffet, but Myrtle McGraw uh, back in 1935, you know, the study of Johnny and Jimmy, and she took two, two twins and she literally was training one of the twins from birth up until uh, at, uh, two years old and just showed the difference between what happened with these twins, one's being trained, one's not being trained. She had a, uh, uh, one of them at 18 months was skating, like on, on roller skates at 18 months. And the other one wasn't neglected, but he wasn't given that same training. And so, so yes, they are children. And yes, they should get out and play and, and, and all that stuff that's great. But I still consider them athletes, and and uh, I'm not going to um, you know, forsake playing. I'm not going to forsake just uh, crawling around, wrestling around, and doing all the things that toddlers do. But but there are definitely things that you can start doing, and from a structured standpoint, um, as young as two years old. I my program starts at two years old. There are definitely things that you can start doing there. Now, before you jump in, Mike, we, I think at this point, we need to put in the disclaimer for all the like the baby Gronk dads out there that are going to take this and run with it in the complete <laughs> wrong direction, right? That this is yeah. not giving, we are not co-signing on you putting your kid like uh, in a training program at 18 months, or okay. don't call me or Mike and say, I want to sign up for sessions for my, yeah. for my one-year-old, right? And now, one of the things <laughs> about that is... At two years old, it's a it's a parent and child program, and they're going to come in, and we have the opportunity to work with the parents too, and get the parents understanding what they can do with their children, and the, and some things that that they can uh, how how much fun they can have with the kids because when when I say it's a structured program, we we don't have two year olds out there lifting weights. You don't have two-year-olds out there trying to uh, uh, trying to um, uh, do shuttle runs and, and and everything else. They are they're literally out there rolling balls back and forth between mom and dad. We have them going and picking up different color things. Uh, you know, so we are primarily trying to get them to trust us because at that age, you know, there there's a huge trust factor that happens. And so if we get the cosign from mom and dad, uh, or mom or dad or one, the guardian, whomever it is then we can get them to trust us so that that uh, once they turn three years old, and this is primarily for, for girls because girls are going to mature a lot faster than boys. Uh, and so, but we, we get that cosign with them and then uh, the rest of the stuff is it's just so much easier to do. All right. So, you know, we, we, you know, you're talking about sort of laying the foundation and, you know, when we talk about long-term athletic development, yeah. um, how long is long? And uh, can you sort of elaborate also on, you know, sort of that timeline of skill acquisition and, and how that generally looks? 
Well, uh, long depends on depends on uh, some of the activities that the child that the, uh, athletes do. Uh, you have um, you have I say golf. Golf is this. Uh, if we're, if we're looking at trying to help that athlete become an expert at it, so that's meaning getting to the professional ranks and and winning an event, golf is like a twenty year sport. Uh, so it's not something that's going to be five years. It's not something that that's going to be ten years. But long term, to be say you're a volleyball coach and you start working with children at at seven years old, uh, and then maybe you stop working with them at eighteen before they leave and, and head off to college. And so that's going to be that seven to eight, 18. So that's going to be your long-term program. And, and I mean, we can totally get into, um, if we're looking at, at the stuff that Bali did, you know, we, we have the active start, we have the fundamental phase, we have learn to play, train to play, uh, all of that. So we, we, we can talk about, about that aspect of it, or, you know, you can look at, you can look at, um, uh, you know, these, you know, the, the uh, three stages of learning, you have your cognitive stage, you have your associative stage, you have your, uh, your autonomous stage, you know, that cognitive stage where, where, um, where the athletes are learning to process things, learning to process things. And then the associative stage, you know, where they, they try and, you know, they're translating, you know, that, that knowledge into, into action, you know, it, it, it's a procedural thing. And then the autonomous stage, Everything's just automatic. Now that you know, we don't know how long that's going to take, but uh, one of the big things that that I look at is understanding that when children uh, and and girls are going to be about a year and a half, uh, typically a year and a half before boys, they're they're a year and a half more, more mature, and so you look at girls from about. Uh, four years old, uh, boys from about uh, five and a half years old. So girls from about four to about seven, eight years old, boys from about uh, five and a half to about uh, nine years old. Now they're in a stage of, of development, of physical development where, where we can, um, where we can, as coaches, we can help them train certain muscle fiber types. We can help them uh, work on their type 2A, 2X, whatever those, I mean, they change names now, the fast switch muscle fibers, and we can help them work on those so they are doing things quick, fast, powerful, strong. So everything they do, we want them doing it fast. If they're throwing a ball, they'll throw it as hard as you can. If they're jumping, jump as hard, as high as you can, run as fast as you can. If we want to try and, and uh, influence those fiber types. Um, then the next thing that happens is uh, there's this prepubertal neuronal explosion that happens. So the capacity for learning is just astronomical. Now, so the body, the growth slows down, uh, but the neural, you know, the brain, it starts. I mean, those axons and dendrites, they just start firing. Um, now they're, they're learning at that point. And so that's when there's concepts of linear algebra, abstract design. Um, how they can learn four different languages and, and four different instruments. And in my case, me being selfish, they can learn proper movement. And so at that point, I'll say they're playing baseball or they're playing uh, football, they're playing basketball or golf. Now, I want those coaches to teach them everything that they need to know, every movement that they need to have to make it on the PGA Tour, to make it to the NFL, or to make it um, uh, to Major League Baseball with full knowledge that they won't be able to do it all because they don't have the strength to do it. But we don't care about the strength right now, or we don't care about them being able to actually do it. We care about them learning how to do it. So it's the motor control, it's the motor patterning that's happening right then. So that's when they can, they can learn it the best. Then what happens after that comes puberty. And so puberty, now they get testosterone. They get estrogen, more estrogen. They get the hormones and the strength to be able to do all those things that we taught them 
during that pre-puberty stage. Now, and so, so yes, yeah, so there is a there is a method to this madness, and and if you um, if you follow that, and I've worked with thousands of athletes now, and I've just seen it happen over and over, and it's it, it's an amazing thing to see them go down that right pathway and the ones who who do because some of them don't you know because there's a lot of people who get into that that uh that pre-puberty stage and they start they start winning things and winning is very very enticing it's it's very addictive and so they get off of the track and and then more times than not those who get off that track they stay off of it you know they they don't come back you know so so but yeah but you know so yes there is sorry for being so so long-winded but there is a there is a method no not a problem at all madness. well it, it's it's interesting because you know i love i love how you're going at it because I, a lot of people go out there and and eric i'm totally just taking over right now because this is my wheelhouse um but a lot of people out there are just like just let your kids play and they'll figure it out. And it's like, well, yeah, that's, that's step one. Like, I love the idea yes. of letting them play, but when you know what we know, yeah. you can, you can organize the play to optimize the result, yes. but it doesn't look like organized play. It's just putting them in situations and environments based off of their age and their maturity where, Hey, if we just do this now, this is our window. So you kind of, I was, I always think about, um, uh, trainability windows, right? And you think about like boys and girls, you talked about it. Like if you look at the kind of the first train trainability window is I'm actually doing some, some, a little bit of work on this right now. And, you know, girls hit that first sort of trainability of speed about a year ish year or and a half ahead of boys, yeah. but don't hear what we're not saying. It's not like they hit the age and you just sprint every day. That's the thing people don't understand. Right. That is, in my opinion, and look, you're the pro, but I'm getting all fired up right now. Right. But that is our opportunity, right? Yeah. If you say, look, this is the time where, you know, most females are going to really be able to develop speed. So all you do is when they are training, put them in environments where they need to compete, race, and demonstrate effort. And that's their speed training. It's not parachutes. It's not sleds. Yeah. Am I on the same page as you, my man? I, I feel like. Totally. totally. We, we have. Um uh throwing balls that speed jumping that speed playing tag that speed uh, i will get out there with with the athletes and and i mean just i mean if you just walk up anybody out there who's coaching kids just walk up to your kids today one of them and tap them on the shoulder say tag you're it take off running see what happens that's that speed that speed because they're all going to be chasing after you and they're going to be chasing after you and laughing and having a great time. They're going to be having fun doing this. And so, so, uh, as you, as the coach, as long as you're out there and you're enjoying yourself and like you get out there and you start jumping and you start running and you start throwing, you do all that stuff. Those young athletes are going to follow suit. They're going to follow suit. And so, yes, we are absolutely on, on, on that same page. Well, I don't have, um, I don't have kids out there pulling sleds. I don't have five-year-old girls out there pulling sleds. How I, I don't have them. Plus, you know, pulling a sled, you're moving slower. Also, you're not gaining speed anyway. That's gaining strength. You got to get some overspeed stuff to gain speed. You got to run faster. So, but that's, that's beside the point, but it's like, it's like, I mean, we, have fun with them kids go yeah. to a playground they will slide to the bottom of the slide and stand up at the bottom of the slide they'll jump off that slide hit the playground surface take off running that's complex dynamic plyometric movement <laughs> into into power and then into speed now that is fun that is a speed window that is a time where where you can take these athletes and help influence that muscle fiber type. Told you it's going to be a good one, Perry. So <laughs> I, want, I want to get, let's keep going back to, to what you said, Milo, about the method to the madness. And so yeah. World Health Organization, it's got a checklist of developmental milestones over your first yeah. 24 months to kind of gauge healthy progress. 
Um, but after that, we don't really have a universal system for, for movement minimums. And that's how you know, our common mentor, Greg Cook, came up with the FMS to, to look at that in adults. But what do you use as kind of your personal checklist of milestones of skills and activities that should you should be able to achieve and at what point of the timeline for kids? Uh, well, and I hope you all don't take this as, as a cop out because uh, I don't have a checklist as much as, as I have you know, just things that they should be able to do. Um, and the time that they do it, that's going to depend on, on when they, when they come to us, because we have, we have, we have six-year-olds, seven-year-olds who come to us and they've never kicked a ball. We have five-year-olds who come to us and, and, and I'm looking at, I'm looking at them trying to skip or trying to hop. You know, trying to do some of these fundamental movement skills, and I'm asking their parents, you know, did did, did they crawl at home? Like, no, not not really. We would pick them up, or when they they had a walker, or our nanny would do this, or and all that stuff. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, these kids haven't had an opportunity to be good athletes. You know, they haven't had an opportunity to learn how to move, and so, um, so those. I just mentioned skipping. I just mentioned hopping. So those things, when I know that they are able to skip properly, you have right arm, left leg, left arm, right leg going down, that cross patterning that's happening. I know they're able to do a single leg hop. So you're hopping on your right leg. That left leg is that momentum leg. And it's going you know, in front of and behind the center of mass. Uh, there's good arm swing that's happening to it. And I know they're able to shuffle. So they're able to keep their body facing perpendicular to their, their direction of travel. They don't have to turn into that direction. Their feet stay forward. Everything faces forward as they're going right, as, as they're going left. When they're able to do those three things, that is going to open up a new world of athleticism for them. Now, I have five-year-olds who can do that. I have five-year-olds who can skip, they can hop, they can shuffle, they can do all those things just right. I have 11-year-olds who can't. And so when I say, I'm hoping you don't think this is a cop-out, it's not an age-related thing because you have kids who are much younger you know, who are able to do it than some of the old kids because they were not exposed to it. And so there are, there are, are activities that we have to get the kids exposed to first. And then from there, there is an there is an order that happens because I can tell you that um, when you're able to get a kid to skip, you know, there is a direct correlation between that and them consistently being able to hit a little white ball off of a tee. There's a direct correlation to them being able to catch better because catching is one of the scariest things for Young, young athletes do you have something that's coming at, at the face a lot of them will duck out of the way and all that stuff but i found over 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 time that the kids who are able to skip they're able to do that with ease now exactly why i don't know i'm not that smart but i look at i look at uh what happens with that with that cross pattern you know this side of the brain as you all know this side of the brain controls this side of the body this side of the brain controls that side of the body the two hemispheres meet that at the corpus callosum and so that that intersection that's back there when these kids are able to skip you know, both sides of the body are working simultaneously and they're in sync with each other and so to me that opens up this world of being able to oh i'm not afraid of this coming oh i can i can rotate my body properly oh i can throw this properly and there's disassociation happens Oh, and, and rotary activities happen, and they happen with, with much more ease. And so um, uh, it's, those things don't happen in like, like at 8 years old, 12 years old, 13 years old. I mean, there, I have adults who can't skip right now. <laughs> you know, so I've seen it. <laughs> exactly. You know, so it's, it's uh, again, it's not... Uh, I, I wish there was a, a time period 
that I could say, oh, at this time, this time, this time, because I don't know how old you all are. Uh, I'm 52 years old right now. When I was in school, when I was in grade school, uh, PE teachers taught us how to throw. They taught us how to kick. You know, they taught us how to do certain things. They didn't make me a basketball player. You know, the basketball coach helped me become a basketball player, but the PE teacher taught me how, how, how to do certain things. You know, they taught the fundamentals. And these days, we don't have young athletes who are coming in with the fundamentals. I mean, I had, I tried running a, a, uh, a speed agility quickness camp, and there were these a dozen kids come in. And so I'm like, okay, uh, let's, let's take this ball. We're going to do some dribbling. We're going to do this, that, and the other. I'm having to teach them how to kick a ball. I mean, these kids haven't kicked the ball. They don't know how to do it the right way. I'm, I'm teaching. I mean, I, I turned to one of my assistants. I'm like, dude, we're like glorified PE teachers right now. Oh, that's what we're doing here because these kids aren't getting in at school. Now, granted, you know, PE programs are being just, I, I won't get into that. <laughs> just, um, but, but yeah, but it's, uh, so, so there's not a, a, a particular time during life where that right there should, should happen. Is when are you exposed to it? And then the stuff happens. Hey, everybody, a quick break in the action here. Hope you're enjoying the show and we appreciate you listening. We're working hard to bring you the highest quality content and best guests every single week. So if you could do us a big favor and go and like and subscribe to the show on whatever platform you get your podcasts on, it would be greatly appreciated. Be sure to listen at the end of the show also to find out where you can find out more information about our courses, as well as a special discount code for all our listeners. Thanks again, and let's get back to the show. All right. So you kind of alluded to this, uh, but I want to dig a little bit deeper because you were talking about sort of the age uh, or, or potentially the grade of an individual. And, um, you know, a lot of sports go by grade and they don't go by chronological age. And, and that can be an issue, right? Because like, look, if like I so I have uh, I have two boys, I have a 12 year old and I have an eight year old. And, um, you know, my 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 middle schooler, man, like him, his buddies from when I saw them coaching them four or five months ago in the spring till now, they look like different kids. And, and that's the one thing people really don't understand is a lot can happen. So why why is the idea of doing things by grade kind of a flawed, a flawed way of looking at things? Oh, um, um hoping your viewers have heard of uh heard of the, the matthew effect now that's uh, that's um this is effect it's been studied it's taken from biblical reference um uh where it's um put in and thomas in terms it's the, the the rich get richer now it's uh i think the the whole quote was uh for those who have they will be given even more for those who have not even what they have will be taken from them and so where that, uh, you know, that's been, as I said, it's been studied. I mean, there was one study that had, I think it was about like 400,000 scientists were, were, uh, were studied, like their, their career tra trajectories uh, from, the, from the time they started and what they were able to do uh, early on and, and how their careers lasted versus those who did not have the advantage of, of, of starting early uh, same thing that happened with with uh, there were athletes in four different sports. Well, um, where this happens with kids, uh, we know that uh, our biological age, which is uh, how mature we are, you know, how close are we to adulthood, how mature our, our cells are, our muscles, all that. Um, our biological age can differ from our chronological age to a little more than three years we can be a little more three years older or three years younger than than um than our chronological age and so if we look at that and say these these cutoff dates we have these uh under 12 or under 10 whatever these under things are uh, if a cutoff date is is january 1st you have to be 10 years old on january 1st so you have one athlete um, turns 10 on December 31st. Then you have another athlete, number two, 
turns 11 on January 2nd. So on January 1st, they're both 10 years old. Now, one athlete just turned 10, so it's closer to nine. One athlete just turned 11, closer to 11. But now if we look at the extremes and we go three, three and a half years ahead, three, three and a half years behind, that 11-year-old is now 14, 14 and a half, and that nine-year-old is now six, six and a half. Yeah, they're both <laughs> 10 years old. So now you have a six-year-old going against a 14-year-old. What's going to happen? The coach is just going to say, yo, um, uh, Johnny, go and, go and grab Mike's shot for me. Oh, and, and, get, and, and help Mike do this. Help Mike do that and all that stuff. And so um, we miss out on so many kids in athletics because of chronological age, because of grades, because of, of, of this, this insane notion that, that the amount of, of days and minutes and, and, and seconds that we've been on this planet dictates what we're able to do. It's, it, it is a crock in there. Um, uh, oh, goodness. I mean, there's, I've had athletes who I've told their parents, I was like, hey, she, hey, we just did some stuff today. We were doing some hurdles. And I was showing them hurdling. And she actually hurdled these hurdles. She didn't jump over the hurdles. She hurdled these hurdles. I was like, you really should take her to a, a track coach. Take her to a track coach, specifically a hurdles coach, because I cannot believe what I just saw today. She was not, and this, this young lady, she was nine years old at, at the time. And so the mom, uh, so the mom, she, she uh, um, tells me, it's like, yeah, we, we took her, but the coach says we don't start kids until 10 years old. <laughs> and I'm just like, he said, they don't start kids until 10 years old? Uh, did he even see what she was able to do? Uh, and so it, it, it's, it's crazy that, that we don't enable these, these, these and we don't enable ourselves to work with all the kids, to work with, with all the skills, to work with uh, kids who have different, different levels of strength. We, we don't know what we have until we get them out there and actually test them and, and, and we actually see it. Yet we're just saying, okay, well, you're 10 years old. You have to be with all, all the 10 year olds. You know, so, but yeah, that's why it, it, it just, it screws up kids. We, we lose out on kids because of, of those barriers. Now there's a bunch of stuff I want to run on with this Milo. So we lose and, and people are going to assume you're going to lose the bottom end kids, which you do. Um, but you also forget what you're doing to the top end kids yeah. who's, and I know from work with a lot of baseball players, who's that 12 year old who hits 40 home runs in a year. And then when they get they, they to high school, and they realize they're not that good anymore. And the psychological impact that that has, that they can't figure it out why they're not better anymore, where they were the God's gift to baseball just a couple of years ago. But then there's also something that I've heard you talk about where if you can keep those younger ones that are, that are on the lower end of the, the, uh, of the biological progression, if you can just keep them playing long enough that they actually have a huge advantage, correct? Because of the skills that they've had to learn of, having to keep up with, with, with the others. Exactly. Um, uh, oh yeah, the, there's nothing wrong with staying in, in a phase longer and just uh, continuing to learn longer, continuing to get faster, longer, continuing to, uh, um, get that hand, that eye hand coordination longer, nothing wrong with, with that. Um, uh, the problem is not with the kids. The problem is with the adults. It's with the parents um, because they want everything fast. And I was like, look, you know, they they think everyone, everybody matures at the same rate, and that's that is so far from from the truth. Oh, you, know, you as a coach, you have to be there for the ones who are maturing faster and making sure they're staying they're staying interested. You have to you have to challenge them. Uh, as much as you're challenging the the ones who uh, the, the the late bloomers, you know you have the early matures, you have the, the late bloomers. You have to challenge both of them. 
So you, um, uh, you, you're not, okay, let me stop. One of the big things, one of the big problems we have with this is everyone wants to freaking win. Everybody wants to win stuff. And so when, 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 and when winning doesn't matter, uh, like what, what, I mean, the 12 year, the best 12 year old on the planet, who is it? Better question, who cares? Who cares? Now you're trying to develop these kids. You're trying to develop these kids. And so and if, if you as a coach have this mindset of I'm going to develop these children, then you're challenging the early matures and you're challenging the late bloomers. You're, you are, you're looking at trying to create something that's going to be amazing at, at 20 years old, at 25 years old. You're not trying to create the best 12 year old on the planet. You know, so though so, uh, sorry for getting a little loud there, but um, yeah, this, this is something that, that we absolutely have a problem with. Uh, Cause I see, I see kids who, and I know kids um, uh, whose parents have come to me and said, oh, Levi was on the team. They won the championship. And he said he hated it because he didn't get to play. He's like, dad, yeah. I would have rather be on a team that lost every game as long as I got out there to play. Okay. So as a parent, there's that question, do I have my kids play up? to get better with the better competition? Do I have them play with their eight? Like that creates a tricky situation for the parent. Well, I think the, uh, uh, the parent is, yes, the situation is tricky for the parent because the leagues, they dictate so much stuff. You know, these, these um, I've, I've seen so many different things happen with I don't know, this different travel league or, or, um, or even some of these, these, these rec leagues. But um, I'm a huge proponent of talking to my kid, talking to my child and saying, hey, what's fun for you? What do you want to do? Um, now, I will tell them that, look, this right here, if you do this, this is probably what's going to happen. If you do this over here, this is probably what's going, going to happen. Um, and and I, I will guide them. Now, uh, but at some point, this is going to be on them because uh, we know that the children who who are sitting there bugging their parents, Dad, take me to the take me to the cages, take me to the cages. Can we go to the cages today? Can we go again? Can we go again? Dad, can can we go out and hit, hit some balls? Dad, can you hit, hit me some balls? Can you do this? And all, all of that stuff. When they're doing that, you know, they are the ones who um, who are leading that charge. When the parents consistently have to drag them somewhere, maybe the, maybe the kid doesn't like that too much. Maybe the kid doesn't like it too much. And so, um, so for the parents, I would say, look, listen, listen to, to your children, talk with them. Talk with them constantly about what they like and what they don't like about these particular programs. You know? And then, um, uh, and granted, there's a lot of these programs that don't like me because I kind of tell I, I stand for the athlete. I will always stand for the athlete, even when the athlete, the athlete's parents and the organizations don't stand for, for the athlete. Um, uh, and sometimes you know, I, will, I, will, I will tell the, the parents, I'll be like, look, interview this organization, see what this organization is about. Are they about development or are they about winning? Now, what, what's going to happen to your child in this sphere? And then let your child know this is what's going, going to happen. Okay. Now, there's some elements of the, the, the broken system. And I don't even know if they're necessarily malicious, but you're, everything you were talking about earlier about the cutoff dates. And like Malcolm Gladwell and Outliers talks about, yeah. you know, how they discovered so many players in the NHL yeah. were born in January because that was the yeah. cutoff date for, for yeah. Canadian hockey. And what they found was it became like this, this um, snowball effect because they were more physically mature. They got picked for better teams, which had better coaches, which means they got better instructions, which mean they got even better. And it just kind of fed on itself. And then that, that kid who was born a week later, um, they end up kind of losing out on those opportunities of getting trained better. 
And then, like I said, but not only are they losing out, but the, the top kid loses out. I actually had this conversation with somebody at a party the other night, and we were talking about something that happened in an NFL game. And they said, how does someone get to that level and doesn't possess this one fundamental skill? And I said, here's how, because every since that kid was seven, every time he touched the ball, he got a touchdown. And if you have a dad who's a coach or you don't have a coach who doesn't know any better, he's not going to go and correct him and say, you know, you're not holding the ball right. You know, you didn't step at the right foot. You don't need to do this right. And so they don't coach those kids the same. And so that's how their ability allows them to get to that level and still not possess really basic fundamental abilities. Exactly. Because we're not developing. Oh, so if, if, if a, I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm fully aware that my job as a, coach especially as a coach of young athletes is to help those young athletes develop and i know that odds are very very good i'm not going to be around when they have their all their public success and and people are lauding them like oh, oh such and such is great with this and such is great with that well but i do know that i'm going to be there so that i can give them a foundation where I can, I can help them along the way. But if, if you are, um, if you are just sitting there, if, if you're one of those coaches who, who doesn't look at your best players and coach those best players and help develop those best players, now what happens later and what happens down the line again, that's on you. That's on you. People, people would say, Oh, he at 12 years old, he was this, he was that, he was the other. He, he just fizzled out later on. I'm looking at, okay, who's this 12-year-old coach? Out those For those people who fizzled out later on, like who was there? Who was the one that, that helped engineer that, that fizzle? Out because um, you know, we have one chance to do this thing right with with these kids because we can't go back in time we have one chance to do this thing right and if if you are really into youth athletics and youth fitness youth development then teach these kids help these kids help these kids develop you're not trying to just go out there and oh i have the fastest i have the fastest kid out there so we're going to win win everything that kid has to develop too. And uh, that's, that's a hard slippery slope because um, you know, when it comes to sports, there's so many different levels, especially at the club level. And, and that sort of takes us towards the, the talk of periodization. I'm not periodization specialization and early specialization because here is the issue, right? It's the, uh, if you want to, if you want to be on the top U11 team, you kind of, they, a lot of places will say, oh, you don't need to, you, you, we want you to do other sports, but yet they want you to play all year round. They're going to charge you five to seven grand, you know, a year to try to get your, to try to get your money. So, you know, I, I think a big part of it is, is um, when it comes to specialization, I think people need to understand that um, specialization and development sort of, uh, I don't want to say that they're opposite ends of the spectrum, but they kind of are because you, you, I love say that it. you keep on using the term development because you know, development is a, in my, in my, the way that I look at it is like development, I think journey, I think like, man, it's going to take a long time to develop this. Whereas, you know, you get into situations where people are, you know, want to specialize early and it's just like, and it's hard because the kids want the recognition, the parents want their son or daughter to be the best. But at the end of the day, like you said, it's like, you know, I want to work with athletes that are going to peak down the road, not peak at 12. Yeah. And, but that's a hard thing for kids and even parents to understand because they don't understand development and they don't understand slow cooking the process. So when it comes to specialization, what, what are your thoughts, Milo? What do you think we should be doing? What's the right way to do things? Well, the, well, I, I know the right, the right way is, is, <laughs> you know, but um, now there are, there are three sports out there that have been you know, studied in research. I believe Isavan Bali did this a while back. You have um, women's gymnastics, you have women's uh, figure skating, you have women's diving. You now, those are sports that, that you know, if you want to be one of the best in the world at it, you, know, you start 
early, early on. And notice I said, women's this, women's that, women's that. The other thing, uh, uh, you look at, look at uh, Coco Goff. I mean, she just won uh, this, this, she just won the US Open, uh, 19 years old. She youngest person making a Wimbledon final uh, or that she's 15 years old. Then, um, uh, and that's going to happen with girls because girls mature faster than boys. There are some 15 year old girls out there who, who have the bodies of grown women. There are very few 15 year old boys out there who are going to be, be able to compete with grown men. Uh, they, they don't have, they don't have the same tools. The girls are going to have the same tools. They can get out there and, and, and compete. And so, so this specialization part, yeah. Um, uh, first off, it's just those, those three sports, you know, the uh, other sports, I mean, Coco Golf, she played, what was it? Four, four sports Something like that before she focused on, on, on tennis. Uh, it's like, like, um, uh, the research it, it's out there and, and there's so many of our best athletes, so many of our best athletes played multiple sports. And, and the only reason, at least to me, the only reason uh, we have this specialization out there is because, or we have this rampant early specialization with all these different activities, all the different sports is because we have organizations who are greedy, organizations who just want the, the dollars in their pockets. And, and I mean, when, when I hear about, when I hear about kids at eight years old, eight years old, being asked to sign a contract saying that he will not play any other sports blows me away. I mean, I, 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 I don't get that. I don't get that for someone who is supposedly uh, passionate about, about developing young athletes, you're making them freaking sign contracts at eight years old saying that they won't play any other sports. Uh, and, and it's like, and I know around here there are, and I'm sure it's, it's like this, some everywhere you have, you have some travel programs. What this is, it's almost the fall now. Uh, there are travel programs out here whose parents, they've already paid for spring 2024 because they're trying to keep them in this, in this cycle. Well, now, they get you, they get you, man. Kids. What, what they get you. They get you. It's a business. When oh, you do sign God, up and make God. a team, they give you literally that most a lot of clubs will give you 24 hours to make a decision or your roster spot is gone. Huh. Literally, right. that happens. That happens a lot because what they don't want you doing, if if you play for a team and they don't want you playing for another team, they're gonna block you and they're gonna set up their tryouts ahead of the others. And this happens all the time locally. I see it. They set up the tryouts ahead of time. So you can't try out for different teams because if you only make one and that's the first one, you don't know if you're going to make the others. So you have to commit kind of to the first one you make if you're new to the game. And it's really, really stinky because we got caught up in something like that too. And I was like, this is absolutely a sham because, and, and the funny thing is they called their program a developmental program, which I was like, this is not developmental. This is going to develop your bank account, which is, hey, good for you, I suppose. But that's not what I'm here for. Oh, exactly. And it's, and and then, I mean, and I know I'm I'm probably going to get blasted by by some people watching this on this one. It's like we have these we have these activities out there that perpetuate this. You know, one of them called the Little League World Series, you know, which is, which is, um, we have these kids who. I mean, first off, they're like peaking at 12 years old. I was like, there are a lot of these kids who are playing, who are getting in this. I was like, this is going to be the peak of their athleticism, the peak of their sporting career, because that's what they've been trained to do. They don't play anything else. All they play is baseball. Um, uh, all they do is swing bats. All they do is throw balls. All they do is field. Um, you know, they don't get out and and kick a ball they don't get out and and uh uh they don't oh, goodness they there's no basketball there's no football there's no swimming there's no 
Uh, there, there's no racket sports. They're, they, they're not doing any of these things because these coaches have gotten into the parents to, the, to an extent. They're telling the parents, your child, if your child takes this, this time off, uh, he or she is not going to advance with the team. They're going to fall behind. They're going to fall behind. I'm like, have you heard of Bo Jackson? Have you heard of Deion Sanders? Have you heard of some of these multi-sport athletes who are some of the best athletes we've ever seen in these sports? How And you're going to tell me that, that this is the only thing that they can do to make it to that level. When there are so many people, I think what there was, uh, not this past year, but um, there was a couple of years ago, I, saw, I was reading how the the uh the the um players on the u.s women's national uh soccer team that there were like 54 different sports played between the the i don't know how many 20 players or whatever it was 54 different sports played something crazy and i'm like how is that not just telling people how is that not beneficial for folks to, to see and understand and look at and say, no, we're, we're not doing this right. We're not doing this right. I mean, I, I had a kid come out while back a golfer who, uh, when his dad told me that his golf pro, this is a, this is like a, a 12 year old kid, um, a very, very skilled, very skilled young, young kid. But he went to this golf pro who the dad said, would not take him on unless he played another sport. I had to call that golfer up and say, dude, I'm loving you. I'm loving you. Because all this kid wanted to do was golf. Hit balls, hit balls, hit balls. So he made him play another sport if he wanted to be coached by him. And we need more coaches like that. All right. So let me stir the pot here a little bit, Milo. Let, let me give a counterpoint. Okay. So let's say you have that kid who loves golf or the kid that you yeah. talk about that just loves baseball yeah. and they don't want to play another sport because maybe I could argue that going and playing in another sport just puts them in, in a shit show in a different sit in, in a different scenario. Right now they're just in a basketball gym in the same, Hey, we got to win a plastic trophy in this, you know, uh, March madness tournament that, you know, nobody cares about. So what if that kid really likes a sport and it's not so much multiple sports, but it's multiple activities. And yep. the reason why I'm thinking this is like, one of the things I love is when Greg Rose talks about like how you assemble a, a junior golf camp for TPI, yep. they get there and they don't touch a golf club for a vast majority of the time. So what if I had in a perfect world and, and I'll, I'll, I'll lean into baseball because I'm kind of, what if I could build the ultimate developmental baseball academy where, yeah, all you do is you're just a quote unquote baseball player. You're, you're specializing in baseball, but maybe only 50% of the time we actually do baseball specific activities of throwing, hitting and fielding. And the other 50% we're doing something else to enrich your, your physical literacy. Could that work? Yes, that could work. If the coaches have, like if, if you're a baseball coach, but you have someone else over there who understands that fitness side of things, who understands how to incorporate all those other activities. If you have, if you have that fitness side, you have that baseball side, yes, that, that will work. I have, um, uh, I've been preaching this for, for the longest, you know, obviously being, being with TPI, that's one of the things that we, we do preach. And, and um, I had a dad uh, come up to me um, one day and he's like, you know, coach, I know you told me to get him in these other sports, do these, uh, do these other things, but all he wants to do, there's two things he wants to do. He wants to play golf and he wants to come to you. That's it wants to play golf and come to you but the other day he comes up to me and says dad can i go over to johnny's house and, and play play basketball and i looked at him and was like when did you start playing basketball he's like oh my milo has a goal down as down at his gym and and we we were shooting around some and he was showing us how to how to do some lips he was showing us how to how to do this 
And then, so I'm like, okay, go for it, go, go, fight. Then uh, he comes up to me again and says, hey, dad, can I go over to Johnny's house and, and, and play football? I'm like, when did you start playing football? Oh, Milo was down there showing us how to, how to, how to throw a ball and how to catch. And, and we were doing yada yada and all that stuff. And so the dad's like, no, nope. he has his other sport and that's you. Uh, and that hit me. I was like, damn, I can't argue that right now. <laughs> because, because, um, because, yes, we have kids who come and they are going to do a multitude of activities. And if you are a baseball coach and you're teaching them fielding, you're teaching them hitting, you're teaching them throwing and all that stuff, and then they have this other half of practice where – where they are kicking and where they're maybe they're running, they're catching footballs, or maybe they're 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 playing flag football, or they're playing, they're 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 jumping, they're they're uh, you know, they they're doing you know all these different activities that are going to force their brain to think differently. They're going to force their brain to move their bodies differently. Then yes, that is something that could work, and. It has worked because, I mean, we've done that for, you know, 14 years now. All right. So one more, I'm going to circle back to right. psycho parents, right? And they all think that their their kids have, quote unquote, it. They have that. Is there such a thing that actually you can see? Because you've seen the developmental process from four or five years old up until the PGA Tour and up until the pros. Is there certain things that you can see and, are, and are, are there key points to know when those things that you're seeing are actually valid or are they going to kind of be fleeting? What kind of are some of the things that you've seen in the people that did make it there that might identify as that it factor? Oh, uh, I have to tell most people, like, look, I'm sorry. Um, I've, I've had thousands upon thousands of kids that I've worked with, and I just don't think anybody can identify professional talent in this adolescent um, because especially these kids who are pre-puberty you know, I was like you don't know what that what's going to happen to them and then and even the kids who get um, who are post-puberty I mean I mean I mean we don't know what's happening in here with the kids this is a this is a huge thing we see bodies yeah the bodies are I mean, you what what this kid at uh, at Tennessee right now can almost throw a football a hundred yards, you know, and and he was he was uh, the greatest thing in the world, you know, since he's seven years old. He goes to Michigan, he gets beat out by uh, by another kid who was not as highly touted that that's him, and so there's supposed to be these can't miss prospects, you know, wasn't. Uh, what was it, Jamarcus Russell? Wasn't he a can't miss pro, uh, prospect? Also, so we we don't know. Sometimes we get lucky with these things. Now, but one of the things I have seen is it's uh, it's very interesting to see that the ones who do make it to the highest levels of high school sports, the highest levels of college sports, and make it to the professional ranks. They're those athletes who put in the most work. They're the athletes who who um, are there bugging their parents and they're bugging the coaches sometimes. Sometimes these are athletes who the coaches trust so much that they give the keys to because they're going to make it there before the coach does and they're in there working. They're in there training. They're in there hitting. They're in there shooting. They're in there um, uh, uh, serving. They're doing all the things that are – that they need to do to make them better. You know, so, but trying to find that one thing and looking at someone and saying, oh, that person's going to be great. That person's going to be amazing. I mean, how many amazing basketball players have we seen come out? You know, people are talking about, I, I mean, how many, uh, was Jordan the greatest thing in the world when he came out of UNC? Was he the? I mean, he he was a uh, he was a number three pick, uh, but just became the the greatest thing ever. Uh, um, oh, and so uh, Tom Brady. I mean, you go up there. When did he get picked? 
It was like, what, sixth round, fifth round draft choice? Alvin became one of the greatest quarterbacks ever. Alvin, so, um, you know, you know, Belichick, you know, Belichick got lucky. You know, Drew Bledsoe gets hurt and Tom Brady comes in and then, you know, Super Bowl after Super Bowl after Super Bowl after Super Bowl, he didn't pick him for, for that. So even that, you don't, I mean, here, here he is. He's, he's a grown man, grown man in college at Michigan, and he still didn't know what he was. Or not he. He knew what he was, but the coaches didn't know what, what he was. And so for people to say, oh, that, that kid right there has it at 10 years old or at 15 years old, get out of here. Oh, you, as a, as a coach, you develop. You help them become the best possible athletes they can become from a physical standpoint, from a social standpoint, from a psychological standpoint, and then you see where that leads them. So you're saying giving full D1 rides to seventh graders is not going to work out. Oh, all the time. <laughs> I literally wrote Harbaugh at Michigan because I, I saw that he, that he gave this, he gave a, he, gave a scholarship, so to speak, to some kid who was in sixth grade, seventh grade, or something like that. I literally wrote him an email, and he actually re responded, too. So I wrote him an email saying, are, are you serious? Do you realize what you're doing with this? Oh, you are the head coach of Michigan. Now, that big M out there, everybody sees that, and you're, you're giving this – you're giving this kid this thing? Oh, it's it that that sets a bad that that, that sets a bad precedent. Well, we That's we could we, we could <laughs> we could run on this all day, and this has been as just as awesome as I hoped it would be. Um, so before we wrap up, tell us a little bit what you got working on uh, this year and beyond. What's new and exciting wow. in your world, Coach? Oh, well, the well, the next thing I have coming up is what I'll be. Um, I'll be presenting at the virtual conference for the NSCA. Um, I think that's October 26th. I'll be doing that. And then um, I have uh, uh, the clay certification. It's, it's online, it's in person, you know, so it's something that, uh, that people can definitely, uh, that they can take that and that will definitely teach them a lot about the, uh, you know, the art of coaching more so than the X's and O's, because most of the questions I've gotten over the past 15 years haven't been, how do you teach Johnny how to hop? How do you teach him how to skip? It's been, you know, I've been dealing with Johnny's parents like this, or I've been dealing with this, been dealing with that. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's granted I'm biased, but it's a very good, it's a very good, uh, uh, it's a very good educational piece today. And um, outside of that, uh, I will be, Hopefully, doing some of the stuff that you all are doing pretty soon. I, I'm, I'm looking at starting a podcast about about young athletes. Fantastic. Well, it's much needed, and nobody be nobody better to to deliver it. So we want to thank you again for your time and your expertise, and want to thank all of you out there for listening. And this has been the Principles of Performance Podcast. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to the Principles of Performance podcast. If you've enjoyed our content, please like and share on your social media outlets as well as subscribe and give us a review on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your preferred platform is to listen to. For more information on the Principles of Program Design courses and workshops, visit us at www.principlesofprogramdesign.com and follow us on all of the social media channels where we post new content every day. To save 10% on any PPD courses, enter the discount code PRINCIPLESPODCAST10 at checkout. If you have any questions we can answer or suggestions for the show, you can email us at info at principlesofprogramdesign.com or message us on social media. Thank you again for your support.